Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Malte. Thanks for choosing the front end talk. I'm one of like 15 engineers at Google not working on machine learning. So definitely appreciate that other people are interested in this. Um, yeah, I work at Google. I specifically work on a thing called AMP Project. If you've not heard about that, it's kind of a thing to make reliably fast websites. And like, while doing this project, I learned a lot about something um, that's the topic of this talk. So, and the talk is going to be a little dark. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start out on, a, on a lighter note, which is that JavaScript really is my favorite programming language, and for so many reasons. For example, uh, you can use it to build applications to make presentations. And just a few examples from, from JSCOMS, what we, what we did over the years. Um, we made like robots, and we made node copters, and we made freaking boats, and we made node rockets, of course. And you really can't like summarize it any other way than that JavaScript is freaking awesome. By the way, when I came to this conference, I was talking to this person telling like, yeah, I went to 15 JS comps already, uh, where she was saying like, yeah, you're really old. Um, <laughs> so there's that. But that, so JavaScript is really awesome, but it does have a really dark side. And it's getting darker when you talk about third-party JavaScript, or as I like to call it, other people's JavaScript. Um, so it's something we definitely didn't write ourselves, and it's also not stuff on NPM, which is typically something you actually want because you like actively include it. Um, Third-party JavaScript works really differently. And some examples are, for example, comments and polls, stuff like reviews, ads, of course. I'm going to talk about ads a lot. Social plugins, like you put a tweet on your site, right? You just load some JavaScript file from Twitter, and you trust them to do something that's nice. Um, and it, and it, it might not be, right? Um, I always give this example when you're like, if you were building a native app, and the first thing you do is you say like, hey, I'm going to make an insecure HTTP request and load some more native code from this other third party um, that I barely know. And in the ads case, they like redirect somewhere else. And then you load their native code before anything else happens and run it. And that like, seems really not such a good idea, but that's, that's how this works. And my talk is about like, some examples of what can happen, and then later on uh, what we can do to, to handle it. So I was looking at my, my uh, site that had ads the other day, and I was searching in Chrome DevTools for the object tag, um, you know, which is most, I mean, yesterday, I guess we learned that you can do useful things with it. It's mostly used to, learn, um, to load Flash, and so yeah. So this page had 65 Flash objects on them. And so wondering why, and obviously it's because of ads, which doesn't really explain it. Um, so, so, but here is the, the deep insight. Um, flash movies reduce their frame rate when they're off screen. Right? And that is a very good idea, right? That's, um, even though Steve Jobs was totally against Flash, um, if you reduce the frame rate and you can't see it, that's great, right? You, you don't use as much battery, you don't use as much CPU. And so because of this, you can use Flash to measure, measure whether something's on the screen. And um, that leads us to Spacer of Swift, right? So you can totally put a one by one pixel Flash movie on, on the screen and by observing its frame rate, um, you know whether that pixel is visible. And so you have these ads. And so, yeah. Uh, uh, and so it's obviously, it's very important for the ad um, to actually measure whether it was just not rendered somewhere deep down the screen, whether the user actually scrolled there. Um, so you put a flash movie on it. And um, I mean, that's already like a big step forward, but um, it only tells you something like about the top zero, zero position. Um, so you, you, you add three Flash movies. And there's actually, I think, a standard that says like 25% of the ad has to be visible for n seconds to be considered a view, um, because you need to have these 25%, you add a few more. Um, so it turns out there were seven Flash movies on this ad. And uh, now there's also this issue that there's like 
the advertiser, the publisher, the ad network, they don't trust each other. So you, ra you can get to 21 flash movies on a single ad. Totally not, not, not unheard of. And now you might like correctly qu question me like, yeah, my phone doesn't actually have flash. I'm, I'm good. Um, and of course it can get even worse because the nice thing about this flash solution is at least, I mean, it's, it's in a way incredibly inefficient because certainly you have probably like a VM in each of these flash things. Like, so, I mean, you can't even think about it. Um, but at least it will like push you the information whether it's visible on the screen, right? And um, so today on an iPhone, this is basically the best general solution you can, you can do, right? Where you just pull for where it is, right? You can never know that nothing else moved you around, so you can't like listen only for scroll events. Uh, because some like a thing might be somewhere else, right? So you have to like literally go and make like um, get bound and client direct, uh, and call that like however many times per second you want, and and that is really like the, the worst possible thing you could do to performance, right? You know you do this all the time. You don't you're not even on screen. You're busy pulling, like you're probably calling something like get bound and client direct, which is like basically telling the browser like you have to really 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 render everything on this page. You can't cheat, um, like the waveform collapses. In this case, like 25 times per second, and so fortunately we can do better nowadays. Um, it's it's in Chrome, and it, I think it's coming in Firefox. And for Safari, we can hope for the 2017 version. So there's an API called Intersection Observer, um, where you can just say like, I would like to know what this is, and uh, where this is in relation to the screen, and it, it sends you events as things change, and it doesn't send you events when they don't change. And it also doesn't send you them synchronously. It tells you after the fact, at this time it was there, so you don't have to like, um, do this busy way thing. So that's, that's good. So um, at least there is a way to do this right. Um, doesn't mean everyone's using it already, but um, I think it's a, it's a great, um, uh, great change. And, and you can use this for other, other, many, many other useful things. All right, so that was uh, why we have so much flash. Um, next thing I want to talk about how browsers parse web pages. Um, it's, it's really simple. Uh, you take an HTML doc and look at its tokens. Um, this is basically a diagram. Um, there's a bit more complexity there somewhere, um, but um, that's essentially how it works until you see something like this. Um, probably all heard about document.write. Um, and the magic of document dead write is completely synchronous. It changes how the current document is being parsed. So even if there's like an open tag, you can like write into that tag. It's really, really weird. And um, it gets worse because you can actually write scripts, synchronous scripts. And those can do more document dot writes. And that wonderful, simple state machine um, becomes something like this. So where we like, have to parse, and we say, oh, we have a script tag. Um, we have to execute it. Um, it document writes something. We have to parse the output. Oh, there's another script tag. Um, and then we download that, and then we basically um, re-enter in our state machine, um, and things become really slow, right? So the, um, basically what you get in, like, in JavaScript language is you have this synchronous XHR that gets to modify the currently parsing document. And, you, and that, that is recursive, right? Um, and it's in, in, in strong violation to what I call the, the first law of JavaScript APIs, is that they all will eventually be asynchronous. Um, you have this, like, you start asynchronous because there's, you only have to do like one plus one. Eventually, it will be asynchronous. Uh, but this entire, the semantics of document are right, do not allow um, anything to ever be asynchronous. So even though um, every player in the game might be completely fine with making their stuff asynchronous. If anything relies on, the, on that synchronous semantics, you can't change it. Um, and so we get to the opposite is if anything relies on being synchronous, obviously every child has to be synchronous. There can't be anything asynchronous. And, and, and the thing is that synchronicity um, really, really doesn't scale. So um, for example, um, you're like on the website, and I was like, I would like to have an ad. And that's obviously synchronous. And then, but you don't really know how to make ads, so you, this is like another JavaScript file, like 
do you know how to make ads? That's a synchronous request. And because like ads are like many players, you're like, can you help us um, find out which ad to draw? Another synchronous request. Um, and then because you found out that you make more money this way, like let's ask these other folks over there if they have better ads. Another synchronous request. Um, and then they say, no, no, we resold this to some other party. Um, and then they make another synchronous request. And then they finally say, OK, now we try to figure out how to make ads. And it can be arbitrarily deep, um, which leads to these absurd situations where, um, where web page load times get so slow that you can literally bake cookies during them. Um, there's, the Chrome team currently has this experiment where they kill document right if you're on 2G that's already launched. And soon they will always do it when you're on a 2G-like connection because you get, you get like um, document that write like cascades are 50 element de deep. If each request takes 10 seconds, you had 500 second web page load time. And you see absolutely nothing at all um, during this entire time, which can't be good for anyone, right? Cool. Uh, so we have how do I measure something on screen? How do I load something synchronously? Um, next is the what I personally found, like that was my own um, impression was the, the most awesome hack, hack in JavaScript ever. It was actually done by Mozilla. Um, they made a thing called Broadway.js. And um, what they built was this native JavaScript H.264 decoder um, that was you know, decently fast. And so that, that seems like really cool. Like you can use JavaScript to decode H.264. Um, I think it's pretty impressive. Um, now we need some more context. So um, Chrome Safari both agreed that autoplay as a feature of the video tag wasn't a good thing on mobile, right? And you can totally understand why they would think this, right? Autoplay means definitely you have to download the movie file, um, so you incur data cost. Um, definitely autoplay with sound can be really awkward, like you're on the bus and your thing like plays sound, that like you don't want that. So they, they made this decision on behalf of the user to say like, um, you cannot like autoplay video, users always have to tab to play video. Combining this with Broadway.js gets us to this, right? So some people were like, oh, well, you can't do autoplay, but we have a JavaScript site, H.264 decoder, so we can do autoplay because that is not subject to any limitations whatsoever. And the consequences were dire. Um, you still use the bandwidth, obviously, because you download the video, now using like XHR. You devastate the battery because decoding in JavaScript happens on the CPU. Um, this is typically on devices that have you know, a decoder in hardware that could do this essentially without using uh, very little battery. Um, so it's running totally on the UI thread. The page janks because it runs on the UI thread. And, and the worst part of this is that now the legit players on, on this web, like us, basically, we want to do autoplay. We can't because we wouldn't do this, um, but the best guys can. And so um, this is, I think, a good example for um, how you have to be careful with doing these interventions because the workarounds which typically do exist once you have a Turing complete programming language, um, can be much worse. All right, this was the very dark part of this talk. Um, I wanted to continue and, and talk about how, how we as developers can handle this better. Um, my friend um, Mayno you know, typically says, like, let's put on the web wetsuit and jump into the shit. Um, like, well, how, can we, how can we embrace the, the bad thing and, and, and at least handle it? And, and so this uh, comes back for um, when we like basically we're working on AMP and we're thinking like how can we, you know, we, this stuff is on the web. We have to deal with it. Like it, it's there. What can we do? And so we decided um, to basically put all the like 3P code behind this barbed wire fence. Um, and on the web, that always means essentially an iframe. Um, and and the first thing we did was. Pretty simple. I think it's, it makes a lot of sense. Which that um, it, once you have an, like something like an iframe, you can decide not to load it. Load content first, then you load everything else. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, next part is that uh, what I call uh, generally containment. Right. So if 
if you need to load someone else's code, having it in, a, in an iframe sandbox can be very useful. Um, it gives you, you know, better security. For example, in AMP, when you load an ad, it will be on a randomly generated domain, right? So they can totally go and set some like local storage, but they will never again, at least in the time of the um, current universe, um, that same domain, right? So that local storage is just gone. Um, and then there's not, the mean also means there's nothing on it that you could hack, right? Um, you have control over resizing because like in, um, typically the third party code, you load it into your page. They own everything. They can do whatever they want. Um, once it's an iframe, they have to ask you, like, I would like to be bigger. And then you can say, mm, no, or like, yeah, it's cool. Um, but it's, it's up to you. And, and I think one of the um, also not uh, obvious things is once you have it in iframe, you can just kill the iframe. So um, one thing, um, well, if everything's on the, on the same frame, you load that JavaScript, like it's very, it's like you could kill the DOM they rendered, but all their shit would still be there. They might hold on to references to the DOM so it couldn't really be garbage collected. Um, so having an iframe is very clean and that you can say, ah, go away, and, and, it, and it really is gone. The, the memory comes back. And the, and the best feature, um, which isn't completely obvious, is that iframes also mitigate documented, right? So, um, and this is completely not obvious, I think. Um, so if you have a documented write in an iframe um, that doesn't actually have the same blocking behavior on the auto page. Um, yeah, last thing that we do, and um, which we so far haven't really talked about because it's a kind of a head and mouse game, um, is that we intervene on behalf of the user. Um, uh, so we, it's another thing, if you have something in iframe, you can like globally change everything in it. But it's our iframe, and so we can throttle timers. Um, and probably shouldn't use these words because they sound really dangerous, but basically what there is, is there's code in that iframe that says, oh, you made another child iframe. I'm going to go there and, and do the same thing. And what I'm doing is I am throttling timers. So, um, and I, I'm going to show um, code for that. So basically, if something's not on screen, like why should you be able to like cause that interval with like 16 milliseconds, right? That doesn't really make sense. Um, but they do it all the time. So we have code like this, and it's really like this is really dirty. Um, so one like the, basically this is just one example. There's like five similar monkey patching functions that go through all the various ways how you could create an iframe. And, and one of them is that you create an iframe, but then you document right into the iframe. That's actually a legit use of document, right? Um, but in this case, you have to call document.close. And so we monkey patch it. Um, we eventually call the original, but we basically, just before calling .close, we document it right another script tag into the iframe and basically uh, recursively call us to, to run that same kind of, we call it manage. That's like a nice word for like um, throttling timers. So we go into a recursive time, uh, iframe and, and um, run the same code again and again. And the actual code looks like this. Um, so again, we monkey patch set timeout in this case. And there's like similar code for like set interval, request animation frame, and, and various cases in there. And uh, set timeout is one of the simplest ones. So we basically just forward the set timeout call to the system set timeout. But before doing so, we, um, we overwrite the time, at least potentially. And the second function is um, the function we actually have. So what we're saying is if um, you're in viewport, you get whatever time you want it. But if you're not in viewport, we'll just add a second to whatever you asked. Um, it, it makes sense to always add a second because that means the order that they expect is still the same, right? You go from like 10 milliseconds to one, 1010 or and from like even if they ask for 10 which would be legit they get 11 so that's kind of like doesn't really matter um, we wouldn't have cared but at least the order is now uh, as expected and so so all of these things together um, really make a difference so we I particularly saw this ad that was using this like um, uh, Broadway JS style h 64 decoding and it was um, even if the ad wasn't visible the, the page was basically unusable and with this code uh, the page is only invisible, uh, unusable when you see the ad, uh, which is actually a big step forward because you can start reading everything else. And, and you can like scroll it away because it's like almost as big as the screen. And, and then everything works again. 
Right, and, and so we, the question is like, by the way, I actually went to the AP website and licensed this picture, um, which you can, I learned. Uh, yeah, so are, are we done? Um, I, you know, I, I think that like this type of mitigation where you handle um, someone else's code is very, very important um, because third-party JavaScript is everywhere, and like you totally want to show some tweet somewhere, right? And that's fine. Um, so it's not something that's going to go away, uh, and that's why I think it's important to, to talk about how, how you can handle it. Um, but in the, I think. Um, in the particular ads case, uh, we can actually do better. Um, so I, again, like I'm obviously working at Google, we do render some of the ads on the internet. Um, so I think like my team has both the privilege and the, um, um, in some words, uh, responsibility to actually fix it. So um, I'm not actually going to dive into what exactly we're going to do, um, but I, I did write a long blog post about this at bit.ly slash amp for as the number of ads for our details for the long-term plan. So basically, um, while there still will be JavaScript around everywhere, um, we're super, super hopeful um, that we can at least have a more, like, uh, like a, a healthier ad advertising ecosystem where like, you don't have to um, mitigate them like everyone's kind of a legit player. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have. Um, again, I'm Malta Cramforce on, on Twitter. GitHub, et cetera. Thank you very much.